Adaptive reuse, I think, is a term that conjures up immediately particular buildings in, in everyone's minds. And, and I feel very glad that I'm actually speaking in, in one of Sydney's prominent examples of adaptive reuse. That through, you know, a hundred years ago, I don't think when they had the railways here being maintained that ever, anyone ever thought that we'd have a symposium with um, wonderfully well-fed and well-drunk coffee um, that we've all just enjoyed. But I, I am curious about how um, in this wonderful eclecticism of our cities, we, we try to build within this eclecticism. I think there was a point in history when we became obsessed with tabula rasa and, and trying to build anew and purely anew. And so I'd like to start by a quote from um, Lord Norman Foster of Foster and Partners, who I was very fortunate enough to interview um, in March this year, who argued that, that change is probably the only certainty that he sees in, in design, that an ultimately sustainable building is the one that you can recycle, that instead of demolishing buildings, you can adapt it to change. The challenge is now then to build buildings which encourage change and which respond to change and to have technologies and techniques which enable buildings to improve their performance. And for, his, for me, his remarks are a reminder of what architecture means and what it can represent. And I, I do have a circular diagram. I, I do apologize slightly for that. Um, but, but I quite like the circle personally as well. Um, and so I've, I've come up with, um, based on the interviews, I had five themes or, or to um, appropriate from John Ruskin, my, my little lamps um, of, of architecture, starting with integrity, which is for practitioners, begins by looking at what is the existing fabric? What is the existing site that we have? And very importantly, to consider what we can retain and what should or could be removed before moving into the idea of memory, which starts to deal with the social and cultural significance of a place and, and a constant reminder that a lot of people have very emotional and personal attachments to particular sites, to particular buildings, and to particular spaces. Um, moving from that, um, you then begin to see the architect intervening with the idea of authenticity, is that we design for our time, and we plan for the time ahead. We, we do not try to mimic, or to copy, or to replicate the buildings, or the forms, or the typologies, or the styles that have existed before. And then flexibility, I in one of my other interviews in, in London, it was pointed out to me that the project brief that an architect or a designer receives in day one is never the project brief that you end up when the building finally opens and you cut the ribbon. And if, if there are any practitioners here who has worked with a client who has not made a single change to his decision from day one, I'd, I'd love to meet that client. Um, please introduce um, them to me. Um, and then, of course, finally, also, it, as we saw in some of the talks earlier this morning, this problem that we have with all of the issues happening around the world and how our buildings can confront that and actually trying to break this cycle of building, demolishing, rebuilding anew and seeing what, how we can actually make much subtler changes to our buildings um, to improve their performance and to bring them with the technology that we have today to current performance standards and, and beyond. And I don't suggest that you constantly need all five, and, and the examples I show today I think are actually an amalgamation and sometimes focus more on some of the five than the others, um, but these were just five principles that really became very prominent as um, more and more of these interviews took place in my research. So. I'd like to take you all on, on my holiday um, earlier this year, and I've got three examples here, one from New York, one in Hong Kong, and one in London, which also look at um, three different ways of how, how different architects have tried to work with the existing fabric. Um, the first one um, in, Was in Washington Street in New York is a placement atop an existing building. I, I then have the Central Police Station in Hong Kong, which is beside, and then one which is probably more integrated and, and probably the most um, subtle, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail with that particular one um, today. Um, so starting off, um, this is a, 
837 Washington Street, which is in New York City, um, by Morris Ajme Architects, which is a very simple building. It's an addition to an existing meatpacking warehouse. Um, it's in the meatpacking district. It sits next to the High Line in New York. And for, for this particular architectural practice, it was about this convergence of the city fabric. Um, the site on which it's located is, um, for those of you who know New York, is where the original grid of Greenwich Village meets the commissioner's grid of 1811, which is where the famous, you know, we get Fifth Avenue, we get all the streets, we get Times Square. That is the 1811 grid that was then imposed, I suppose, upon the landscape. And the twisting of the steel structure, which was part of the five-story addition, is how the architect came to decide and, and tried to integrate, um, you know, it is commercial office space, integrate the um, different and the convergence of city grids upon this particular site. Um, in a distinctively different materiality to the existing building as well. And, and also, of course, in reference to the materiality of the High Line, which, of course, um, was this very um, strong, clearly defined um, steel structure. Um, so moving on to um, the Dai Gun Center for Heritage and the Arts, which opened about a month and a half ago, um, it started, started off its history as um, one of, well, today it is one of, I think, around 100 heritage grade one listed buildings in Hong Kong, which is really not, not that many for a city of, of 7 million people. And it's formed on um, 14,500 square meters um, of land. It's, it's probably one of the largest um, adaptive reuse projects ever undertaken in Hong Kong. And it comprises of three main components. We have here the um, central police station building in, in the um, turn of the century Edwardian style. We have the um, jail cells and police married headquarters, and then also the central magistracy. And Hong, in, in Cantonese, Dai Gun translates into big station. And, and the wonderful um, colloquialism is that um, you could very easily be um, arrested, tried, and um, jailed all conveniently within this same centralized location um, on that note about efficiency and, and use of space. But it's now become, um, with additions by um, Herzog and de Muron, um, who put in two new interventions to create this new center for heritage and the arts. And you can see here in the background there these um, new aluminum um, uh, well, they're, they're semi-porous. They, they range from being entirely porous to semi-porous components, which is at once a reference to this convergence of cultures. You can see here the use of Chinese tiles above what is decidedly quite an English um, adop adoption for the police married quarters. But then also this kind of um, heaviness that sits on the site, which is a reference also to the walls and to the structure of the original jail and prison. And this constant kind of um, horizontality, which they try to reference, but of course also recognizing Hong Kong as being one of the cities with probably the most number of high-rise buildings in the world. And of course, inside, once again, we have this idea of designing for today. It is not in any way trying to replicate the Edwardian, um, you know, the Corinthian columns and, and so forth. It is a decidedly contemporary addition into the space. And then finally, um, I, I'm, I've got the time on the side, so I am speaking slightly quickly. Um, I, I want to take you to London, and this is um, also the recently opened Sami Ofer Centre, which is part of the London Business School Complex, which um, has taken over from the old Westminster Council House in London, in, in Marlebourne. And you can see here, um, just there, that this is really the only visible addition onto the northern facade, and, and there was a preservation and conservation plan that came with this project. Um, and, and it's actually by, um, by the same architect across two different periods. We have a late 19th century edition, which is actually in solid masonry, and then his early 20th edition, which is actually a steel frame building, but then clad in stone, in Portland limestone. And so we, we have a new entrance to this building for, for the London Business School with um, a, a steel structure, a light steel structure to form the atrium, which actually joins up the two, the misalignment in structural grids between this, these two pre-existing buildings. And, and out of that, for, for the architects, I, I'm very grateful to them for supplying me with this imagery. This was part of the demolition, which replaced a, 
um, 1960s infill building, because this building had already been bombed um, during the Blitz in, in World War II. And they, they discovered, in collaboration with their engineers, that um, the piling was sound enough for them to build their new additions atop. There was no need for them to re-excavate and to rebuild and to repile the site. And out of all of this is, you know, you, you get these wonderful new courtyard spaces which are opened up again, which were once filled in with, with all kinds of um, store areas and, and temporary kind of structures that, that infilled the building. Um, and also, you know, new connect connections between the two buildings um, in, once again, this decidedly contemporary manner. And then also going down into the details. So we see here a, um, a, a bronze fixture because English heritage had demanded that um, these either be retained and they were found to not have been retainable. But so this is actually, um, I believe they, they start off with 3D printing prototypes to make, to work on the um, ergonomics, sorry, of the shape. Um, and of course, to bring the glazing up to current um, acoustic and heat standards. And then also, of course, reintegrating things like um, this wonderful thing called electricity, um, fully integrated into part of the building. Um, and, and also, of course, keeping, um, so this, is, this site is still used by Westminster Council, and th there is a, a device that splits it between, um, you know, this is currently in a lecture theatre mode for, for one of the classes at, at the London Business School, but it can actually be opened up um, to double the space for when council actually uses it for its meetings. Um, and, and also all those um, microphones being lowered for, for politicians to, to have their time in the spotlight. Um, and also this, this clear use of the same materiality, but once again, interpreted in a deliberately different um, manner. And, and I think that draws me, you know, the, these were some of the other case studies um, that, that I took. Um, and, and it's starting to, in, in this time where we, we have seen some problems and we are living in a world that is becoming increasingly complex and challenging and dire, um, that we, we should think about our cities not just as problems, as problematic, as as remove and rebuild, but actually as, as sites of wonderful opportunity and potential. And, and that actually many of our existing buildings, even though there are problems in them, they, they are not actually the be all and end all. And, and that we, we should start to move away from perhaps this early modernism, that there is a bit of tabula rasa, as I mentioned very early on, but that our, our city's life is, is in the vitality and the fact that it does come from multiple periods throughout history, and that we are merely one tiny portion of, of this era. Um, I suppose I'm young enough to hope that medicine will advance enough for me to be at the next um, centennial celebration, the bicentennial celebrations, perhaps. Um, but um, that, that we actually are part of a much wider legacy and, and story of our cities, and that this is a temporal um, and rather than a fixed moment in time. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>